more to make me human, to make me whole. Hi, I'm Matt, and I like to throw around big words like this, and this, and this. Okay, that one's not so big. These are interesting because they're common physiological responses to stress. And whenever someone's learning something new, like an ocean sport, they're under some degree of stress. Often the instructor's under a bit of stress also. Now, each person reacts to stress in different ways. There's different types of stress. There's different levels of stress. There are different triggers to stress. But we see some common patterns. Imagine that moment when your student is first getting up standing on the board or they're just figuring out how to ride along under control on the windsurf or they're just doing their water start what you often see is they're so focused on what they're trying to do that they may have no idea what's going on around them they might not even hear what you're saying to them their eyes are often fixated on the board instead of looking up and seeing where they're going and everything is happening really fast for them now there's been a lot of interesting research in the last 50 years that sheds some light on this and this really helps us as instructors when we're bringing someone through this part of the lesson. Our stress response is originally a survival mechanism designed to help us avoid danger or find food. It can be very mild like getting annoyed by being stuck in traffic or sitting for an exam and it can range all the way up to a life or death physical threat like a car crash or a gunfight. In the more extreme cases the effects are much more pronounced, easier to observe. That's why we have a lot of good information from studies involving emergency responders, ambulance, firefighters, police, even the military. And these people, in their training, they get an emphasis on understanding and being prepared for this. What we commonly see is what's often called the fight or flight response, or more accurately, the fight, flight, or freeze response. Now, hopefully your student during their lesson doesn't end up in this situation, but it's entirely feasible that they approach it. In situations like being dragged down the beach by their kite, being unable to sort out their safety system, or maybe they're on a boat or a windsurf drifting further out to sea and they can't make their way back to shore, maybe they catch a fin to the face during their surf lesson. So what happens when we get triggered by stress is our nervous system takes over and it releases a bunch of chemicals in our brains to turn off certain functions and ramp up others. This is something we can't control. If you're interested in that, you can look up some of these words. Adrenaline, thalamus, dopamine, amygdala, hypothalamus, adrenal glands, hippocampus, endorphin, thyroid, cortisol, norepinephrine, glycogen, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, thyrotropin, pituitary gland. So one of the things we often get is perceptual distortion, like auditory exclusion. Our subconscious can be quite good at multitasking, and we see this when we are in what's called the zone or the flow. Uh, a lot's been written about this, but our conscious mind is not very good at all at multitasking. So where we're asking it to focus on one thing, other areas tend to suffer. I'm gonna let this guy talk about a study that was done in 2004 with 49 police officers where they ran them through a simulation. What we're talking about is diminished diminish sound or auditory exclusion, where they took 49 police officers and during a 30 second gunfight with sirens and gunfire um, and people shouting out, during this uh, 30 second gunfight, that these 49 police officers did. What they did it, during the middle of it, they had a loud foghorn. Just go <laughs> You know how many reported to hear that? 97% of the officers during that 30 second engagement did not hear the foghorn. Now if you're a critical thinker and a math person, you're probably thinking, how did they get 97% of 49 people? Well, it doesn't matter but this phenomenon has been observed and documented many times. Sorry, the foghorn went how? Okay. And okay. so I see this a lot when I'm teaching, for example, windsurfing, and my student is coming back from a run, they're approaching, they're maybe five or 10 feet away. We've practiced this before, we've talked about it, but I'll say drop your sail. And all they need to do is let go of the boom 
and let the sale drop and I'll say drop the sale drop the sale drop the sale I might repeat this six or seven times and this whole time they're tense and they're focused they don't hear a word I say until later and then they kind of look up and go ah, ah okay and then they let go have a look at this video there's people dressed in black there are people with white shirts and please count how many times the people in white shirts pass the basketball Did you see the gorilla? If, if you didn't see the gorilla, don't feel bad. The vast majority of people, the first time they see this video, miss that completely. So visual exclusion or tunnel vision happens in much the same way as auditory exclusion. What happens is we lose our peripheral vision. Target fixation is one of the most dangerous traps to fall into as track riders. On the track, panic sets in when you find yourself in a situation you didn't expect. When riders fall into a situation like this, it's extremely common that they will fixate on the target that they believe is going to cause them harm. This could be the edge of the track or the other rider they think they may collide with. When target fixation really sets in, you focus so intently on that particular spot or object to the point where your view becomes completely tunneled down on it and you lose all awareness of everything else going on around you. This is a pitfall I've suffered myself with the exact outcome you would expect. I had the overwhelming sensation that I was running into a corner too fast. This sensation left me target fixating on the edge of the track in the direction I was headed. As such, I froze up on the brakes and my feeble efforts to steer the bike meant the front tire eventually gave up and I ended up in the dirt. Good visual skill allows riders to make better decisions in the moment, which means they tend to make fewer mistakes, and when they do make mistakes, they deal with them better. But as soon as you lose that visual awareness through target fixation, your ability to make decisions and take control is compromised, or in some cases, removed altogether. This can happen against our will. You may have some memory of a situation where you just couldn't tear your eyes off of something. But far more frequently, when this happens, we have no idea that it's happening. So you have your person learning to drive whose eyes are staring at the spot 10 meters in front of the car. Here's me when I was learning to surf, my eyes are locked on, down on the board. Or the kite student who's body dragging and his eyes are totally locked in the kite and he has no idea that there's another body dragger beside him. Or maybe he can't find his board because he can't look for it. Or maybe he doesn't even know where he is compared to the beach and where is the spot he needs to come back to. And again, in the windsurf lessons, I see this so many times. Someone's riding along and their eyes are just locked on their board or maybe on the mast. And when I remind them, okay, look up, they get a kind of a sheepish grin on their face because they realize this is the 15th time that's happening. It's okay, that's the way our brains work. And it doesn't take much to kick this response in. Those of you who missed the gorilla, missed it only because you were being asked to focus on, on counting how many times the ball was being passed. Tachypsychia, or a distortion in our sense of how fast time is passing, is an interesting one because it can go both ways. Sometimes time can seem to speed up and sometimes it can seem to slow down. We often hear stories, and it's a bit of a cliche, that during a very stressful situation, like a car crash, everything happened in slow motion.
that is going to make one hell of a story. In our context, though, we usually see the opposite. People are at a lower stress level, and what they tend to experience is that everything is just happening too fast for them to keep up with. This is because they're trying to keep track of and manage three, four, five new things at the same time, and it's happening faster than what they can deal with. I had a surf student the other day after we practiced all the other stuff and the pop-up. The wave picked him up, started moving him. He just froze, and he says, oh, it just happened so fast I forgot to stand up. So have a look at this kite surfer trying to water start. Now in these few seconds, probably you, the instructor and me, are registering all this. Okay, it's taking him a while to get his board set up in place. The board is on his feet, but he's letting it drift off to one side a little bit. The power stroke is not very efficient. He's not pulling his bar in hard enough to get a sharp turn. He only dived the kite to about 11 o'clock. Then he oversheated the bar all the way in. Then he didn't really point the board downwind. Then he let the bar all the way out again. He straightened his legs instead of keeping his body curled up. And that's why he fell forward. Hopefully he's also thinking, I shouldn't be teaching this guy to water start in 30 centimeters of water. What the student experienced was this. Okay, so those are three kind of brain farty things that people tend to do. It happens to all of us. Now let's look at how we can use this information to improve the way we're bringing people through the learning process. Keep in mind, a little bit of stress is not a bad thing and it's normal, but at those higher stress levels, it's much more difficult to assimilate new information and learn new skills and it takes longer. First of all, just being aware that this is happening is half the battle and a really good starting point. You need to be able to recognize these signs in your students so that you can address them. You need to recognize if it's happening to yourself. I've seen kite instructors take it personally because they've told a student 10, 15, 20 times not to pull on the bar. I've seen them yelling at their students. This doesn't really help the stress level of the student either. And the student needs to be aware of what's happening too. The second thing is based on that very fundamental principle of learning something new, which is to break the information down into small pieces. We want to isolate and target those specific skills so that we know how and when to add the new material so the student doesn't get overwhelmed. Learning to kite surf compared to some of the other sports carries a much higher cost of making mistakes, uh, not only in terms of time lost, but also potential hazard to the student and to the people around them. And yes, people make mistakes, that's how they learn. Often they're progressing best when they're pushing their comfort levels a little bit. We want them to make their mistakes when they're in that space where they can learn and practice getting over the mistakes and bringing everything under control so they can move on to the next thing. We can use our knowledge of these stress responses to help us monitor the state of mind of the student and to fine tune the content of the lesson. One of the things I'll say to my kite students at various points along the lesson is, I'll know that you're ready for the next step when you can do this, 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 and this. And looking around and being aware of their surroundings is always on that list somewhere. Often towards the end of the lesson, when they've been in the water for a couple of hours and they're starting to get tired, you'll see these responses coming out more clearly. And I look for that because that's when I'll stop the lesson. So this awareness not only helps us take care of the student, but we're teaching them to be able to take care of themselves. One thing you'll often see in a kite lesson, the instructors helping put the board on the student's feet. They're helping stabilize the student with the kite so they can do their water start. This is what it tells me. The student's not able to maintain the kite stability with one hand. They can't keep their body position stable in the water. That means they're probably not going to be able to body drag upwind to get their board when they lose it. Their kite control is not good enough to do an effective power stroke. So what usually happens in these cases is that they're given an overpowered kite with lines that are much too long. Even if they do get up and ride for a few meters before they crash, number one, they're not in control. They have no idea where they're going. They're not aware of what's around them. If the kite crashes, will they be able to relaunch it every time? Will they be able to get their board back? All these points along the way need to be in place for the water start. A third thing is use the right equipment that's suitable for your student's level. If possible, 
teach them in conditions that match their level. This makes everything easy for them and allows them to race through all these steps to get the basic framework. Later on, when they're in rougher conditions or they're on more performance gear or faster gear, they can fine tune what they already know to match that. This is why we use great big floaty beginner windsurf boards and small sails. It's why in kite lessons we use short lines right up until the point where the student can actually put the board on their feet, move the kite around a bit and simulate the water start. And it's why surf students get these nice big long wide boards. Hopefully they're being taught in waves that are not too big. So in that moment when you're really focused on something and your awareness is narrowing down and time is speeding up and your brain is sending out the chemical signals, what's going to carry you through that moment is the fact that you're prepared for it because you've trained your motor skills for it. And the only way to do that is through repetition. A good example of this is it's a nice thing to do if you have the chance with a surf student. If you can meet them the day before, show them the pop-up, tell them to go home and practice that 10 or 15 or 20 times. You're not introducing something totally new to the mix, but something that you've already worked on a bit. Um, we used to talk about muscle memory. Really, that's not a thing. It's more about strengthening the neural pathways. And the key is repetition, repetition, so that when you're doing that task, you don't have to focus all your attention on it. Incidentally, what they call creative visualization, even if you're not physically doing it, but you're running through the steps in your mind, that also helps for that moment when you need to call on yourself for that skill. And that's what they mean when they always say, rely on your training. Keeping in mind that these stress responses are happening because of chemicals being released in our brain. There are some things we can do to help manage this. One is controlled breathing, not only in that moment, but in the time leading up to it. The standard training technique to counteract the adrenaline dump is tactical breathing, which has its roots in much older knowledge like Zen, Yoga, and Tai Chi. And believe it or not, the physical act of engaging the face muscles to smile also helps because it releases serotonin, endorphins, and dopamines, which are chemicals that help maintain this balance and counteract the effect of the other chemicals already in your system. Sometimes when I'm riding around with the windsurf student and they've got their concentrating face on and they're focusing, sometimes I look back and go, don't forget to smile. And in that instant, when I see them smile, I see their body relax. I see their eyes look around and take in the bigger picture and I see that their control becomes more sure and smooth. So keep smiling. In general, the more we as instructors can understand what's happening inside the mind of our students, relate to their experience, see things from their perspective, the better we can give them a lesson with less frustration, less wasted time, and more success. That's why I encourage instructors every year or two to learn a new sport, learn something new, whether it's surfing or foil boarding or even juggling so that you can keep fresh in your mind what it's like to be a beginner and make those kind of embarrassing stupid mistakes and, and not be in control it helps us be a bit more patient and that's what all this was about we'll end that there